story because it's just really a fascinating book, The Three Death Sentences of Clarence Henderson. It's, it's an unsettling true story of murder, racial prejudice, and the long hard fight for justice here in Georgia. And the way Chris tells his story, you learn, one of the things I really like about this is you learn not only about the murder case, but the historical background of Carrollton, Georgia, and the personal journey that Chris was on to, to shine a light on what happened. Chris is a longtime journalist, ranging from going from community newspapers to national and international news and wire services. At the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, he covers politics, political extremism, government corruption, and campaign finance. And so it's just, uh, I'm really impressed that he was able to find time to, to write this book. Also joining us for the conversation tonight are Ken Foskett. He's the author of Judging Thomas, The Life and Times of Clarence Thomas. He's a former reporter and editor for the AJC, where he worked for more than 30 years. And Cheryl Turner, she's a member of the Gate City Bar Association, Georgia's oldest African-American bar association. She served as president in 2016, and she's the founder of the Gate City Summer Associate Program, which provides some, um, summer legal experiences for more than 40 students and more than $100,000 in, in scholarships, which is really important because after you read the book, you'll you'll know the importance of having African-American attorneys who can fight for uh, African-Americans who are, who are unjustly uh, accused of, of crimes. Um, we're gonna have a conversation for about 45 minutes or so, but I would encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those a little bit later. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ken and Cheryl and sit back and listen to a conversation about the three death sentences of Clarence Henderson. Great, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, congratulations on a fantastic book. Uh, so, so proud to have been a witness to it. Um, Tony mentioned that I worked at the AJC. Uh, what he didn't say is that I had the privilege of working very, very closely with Chris Joyner as his editor. And the important thing to know about that is I know Chris Joyner's reporting and I know what went into this book is solid, factual, well-researched, well-fact-checked. Mm -hmm. And Chris, you did a really extraordinary job of pulling together a very, very compelling story. And again, uh, congratulations. Thank you. So uh, let's get started. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, Clarence Henderson and who he was? Sure. Um, Clarence Henderson was an uh, African-American sharecropper, uh, born in Carroll County, lived in Carroll County for much of his life. Uh, he was, uh, at the time of the events of the book, uh, father of two with a third child on the way. Um, he came from poverty. He lived in poverty, uh, but uh, he was also a breadwinner for a family uh, and had a rich uh, community that he was part of uh, in, in Carroll County. Um, he was not uh, an angel. Uh, he had 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 trouble with the law most of his life uh, and sort of lived on the uh, uh, on the like like many people of his time lived sort of on the outskirts of society, uh, making a living and as he could. Uh, he was a bootlegger and a gambler as well as a sharecropper. Uh, he was also kind of a rough customer. You know, he was known in his own community in the black community in Carrollton as being someone you didn't trifle with. Not a big man, uh, but uh, could be a a formidable opponent. Mm, there you go. Very good. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, Carrollton and Carroll County at the time that he was living there? What, what, uh, well, tell us about the, the environment that he lived in. So we're talking 1948 to 1953 in that period where most of the events of the book take place. And at that point, Carrollton was very much, and Carroll County generally was very much on the cusp of becoming something 
that it really wanted to be, which was, um, you know, a forward thinking progressive for its place and time, uh, college town, factory town with new employers. Um, it had been a real frontier community uh, from its founding uh, in the uh, early 19th century uh, on the edge of, uh, of the state uh, in land that was taken from, uh, from the native inhabitants through the Indian Removal Act. Uh, it was a rough community for much of its of that first century and beyond, uh, and it was emerging from that uh, period, including it was emerging from the Great Depression. It was emerging from World War II uh, as a community with a lot of pent up uh, aspirations. Um, uh, they had uh, uh, they were they were developing a new hospital. Uh, it was going to be a, a modern hospital, which is you know, most of the people in Carrollton were born at home. This was going to be a modern hospital where people would go for, you know, everything from birth to death. Um, there was a country club that was uh, being established uh, right across the, the street from uh, Burgeoning College, West Georgia College at the time was a two-year institution that had dramatically increased after the end of World War II with returning GIs on the GI Bill. Uh, there was a uh, the community had come together to finance the building of an artificial lake that was uh, initially going to be a draw for employers, but also became a big residential development. So there's a lot going on that was, you know, boosterish and very forward looking for that community as the events of the, of the book start in 1948. Yeah. And, and what I'd about, like to, yeah, like to, um, yeah, Cheryl. Ask Chris to talk a little bit about two newspapers that yeah. existed in Carrollton, because I think it really speaks to, and we'll get to this later in the conversation, but it really speaks to the story that was being told or sold, if you will, um, about what was happening with this trial and who, who those audiences were and, and what the, the leaders of Carrollton, with all this development, with all this change happening, wanted to hear or read in their newspapers. Yeah, I really think that the... Um... Uh, the two newspapers is an important part of the story, uh, why things sort of unfold the way they do. Um, it was a, you know, you, you have to really think about the period. This is the uh, newspapers were such an integral part of any community, and Carrollton had two of them. One was the Times Free Press, which itself was the combination of two earlier newspapers from uh, that had begun in the 19th century. And the other was the Georgian, a newspaper that had just started up in 1948. It was their first year of operation. They were headed by a young publisher named Stanley Parkman, who uh, had previously worked at the Times Free Press, uh, but had been staked uh, for the, to the investment that was needed to create this newspaper by business interests in Carrollton that were unsatisfied uh, that the Times Free Press was boosterish enough. Essentially, the community came together and said, Stanley, we will uh, give you the money you need to start up a rival newspaper uh, because we need someone that's going to, uh, you know, be more invested in our community's success. And that's what Stanley Parkman was doing with the Georgian uh, in 1948. Um, and uh, I think, I think it's, it's important to know sort of that's the landscape because this is where people in the community, largely the white community, but not exclusively, would be getting their news about the events surrounding uh, Clarence Henderson's trials. What about the Atlanta Constitution and Atlanta Journal, Chris? Would they dip into, you know, Carrollton or that, that part of the state? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, both the Constitution and the Journal, uh, which operated entirely separate papers at the time, uh, had far flung correspondence and would send, you know, for, for, for news in, in a place like Carrollton, which would, you know, it take a while to get from, uh, the constitution offices, uh, to Carrollton, uh, without interstates, but they would send their star reporters out there for a big story and did. Hmm. So what about the, the political situation in, in this, in this part of Georgia? Tell us about that. And, you know, particular emphasis on, the state of segregation uh, at that time. Yeah, Georgia, uh, you know, as you can imagine, was an intensely segregated uh, state, as was most of the South. Uh, you know, it was uh, 
In fact, the 1946 gubernatorial election, which occurs just prior to the events of this book, was fought largely over uh, the reinstitution of an all-white primary system. Uh, the Gene Talmadge running for governor promised to, uh, you know, flout court orders and reinstitute a white uh, Democratic primary. And of course, in Georgia, being uh, at that time, the Democrats were the only game in town. Republicans didn't hold any significant offices. So uh, the institution of an all white primary uh, disenfranchised anyone who wasn't white. You know, it was the only it was the only thing that mattered. Um, and so it was, uh, uh, you know, a very, uh, very segregated place. And that in that election, 1946, of course, ends in chaos when Gene Talmadge dies after winning the election, but before taking office, leaving uh, three uh, uh, people claiming rightful heir to the to the office. Uh, and so it's a period of a lot of political tension. Uh, I, and I, I think it's important to understand that. Now, Carrollton itself, Carroll County, was not an area, was not a Talmadge stronghold. Uh, it was a there were a lot of anti Talmadge politicians uh, and important people that lived in that area, which made Carrollton somewhat more progressive and always had been somewhat more progressive on race than the surrounding state. What about you know, black? I, is, oh, like go ahead. To, go ahead, yeah, go ahead like Cheryl. Add, um, and this may be where you are starting to go, Ken, um, a little bit more of the broader political backdrop that was happening um, in Atlanta. Um, one thing that also happened in 1948 was the formation of the Gate City Bar Association. Mm -hmm. And that was 10 African-American attorneys who formed this bar association because they could not participate because of segregation and discrimination in uh, the majority bar association. And so when you had E.E. E. Moore, when you had S.S. Robinson um, come, to Clarence, come to defend Clarence Henderson, you also had the presence of those other eight founding members, um, one of which who was key was A.T. Walden, um, who was a very prominent um, attorney, civic leader, um, political strategist uh, in the Atlanta area. And so when you talk about, uh, when Ken mentioned how the AJC was covering this, you had a lot of interest and in a lot of people who were who were behind the scenes making political moves, uh, positioning themselves with this case to attack Jim Crow, to attack segregation, because that re this really was an opportunity to do that. And you speak to that in your book when you talk about the, uh, how the um, ballistics expert was discredited. That was important because that ballistics expert was um, testifying and convicting black men across the state. And so he was important, he was an important part and the discrediting of him was an important part of achieving justice throughout the state. And really, I mean, it's one of the things that really interests me about this period, Cheryl, is that, um, you know, we tend to think of this decade after World War II in a sort of uh, really sort of uh, rosy sort of scenario where everybody's sort of optimistic and it's going to be American century and everything's pushing forward. But there's so much political tension, so much uh, social tension that's going on. African-Americans emerged from World War II insistent that they gain a greater share of, uh, of equity and, uh, and more access to the, uh, 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 to the broader society. And that's what the Gate City Bar was about. I mean, it was about that legal community supporting itself and, and, and taking what's not being given. Uh, and, and I think that's an important part of, I mean, that's obviously, this is why Gene Talmadge is running uh, right. on the idea that he's going to have an all-white primary. Because right. there are black voters out there who are taking the franchise back. And that's, you know, that's panicking some uh, in, in the white establishment. And that's and that's that's part of the backdrop of this book. I really think it's important. And Chris, what about the black institutions in Carrollton and Carroll County at that time? Well, you would have churches. Was there NAACP chapter? What was the what kind of formal institutions existed for uh, black I mean, they were, they, to... I mean, they were largely uh, informal community institutions. Carrollton had, um, uh, like, if you, if, if, you, if you go back in Carrollton's history, it was not a large slaveholding area, for instance, and part of that was because the land didn't uh, support large agricultural, uh, 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 large agricultural operations. And as a result, 
after uh, the Civil War and through Reconstruction, uh, you know, the, the African American community stays pretty small. Uh, it stays, but it stays, uh, it's very cohesive. Uh, they move uh, in uh, the decades following the Civil War away from sort of the more rural areas and congregate around Carrollton proper in, uh, in communities there and support each other. Uh, it's a, it's a, as I say, it's a period of intense segregation, uh, but you would look at the African-American community and Carrollton as being, you know, uh, supportive, uh, in that, in that sort of isolation that it was in. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what happened in 1948 that ultimately ensnared Clarence Henderson? So on Halloween night, 1948, uh, a white man named Buddy Stevens, he's hard, just barely a man, he was 22, uh, was uh, on a date with his girlfriend, uh, Nan Turner. Uh, and they, had, they were parking in a car on the edge of what is now Sunset Hills Country Club, the country club in town. It was under construction at the time. Uh, and it was sort of a popular lover's lane kind of area. Uh, and uh, they were abducted by a masked man. Uh, and what would later come out was that over the summer and into the fall, there had been a series of abductions and rapes in Lover's Lane areas in Carrollton that had largely gone unreported. Uh, police had kept a lid on it uh, in hopes that they would, you know, crack the case uh, and, and, they had gotten some buy-in from the local journalists not to not to write about it. Um, usually, what happened in those cases is that uh, the rapist would scare off the boy and would would sexually assault his date. Uh, but Buddy Stevens uh, was a veteran; he had just come back from uh, overseas as a, a military policeman in the army, and. Uh, was not someone who was scared off. Uh, and he fought with the man uh, and was shot in the process. Nan Turner escaped, but she was unable to give any description of her captor other than she thought he sounded African-American. She said, she said he sounded like a Negro. Um, and that combination of, uh, you know, random violence uh, that crossed racial lines combined with the idea that was so, embedded in the white mind at the time that white women were in constant peril from black men uh, inflamed the community. It was such a chaotic shock for a community like Carrollton that um, uh, it, I mean, it became a, a I mean, people had to be warned in, in, in the Georgian, for instance, uh, the, the publisher of the Georgian wrote a column warning people not to uh, panic and 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 he warns someone's going to get shot because they were so you know people were so concerned about what was going on um and in and so the death of buddy stevens um demanded in the white community a response and the response was fatally flawed really from the beginning they were only looking for one type type of culprit uh unidentified black man and and the response from the uh from the police investigating the crime was to essentially throw a dragnet over the black community in Carrollton, Carroll County, in fact all of West Georgia uh in the search for a suspect. Uh and that involved and you can read in the book that involved, you know, essentially kidnapping black men and holding them in the secret prison and and interrogating them taking the black community and shaking it in an attempt to dislodge a, a suspect. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I mean, remind us how many people they went through before they got to Clarence uh, Anderson. I mean, I, you know, the full impact may never be known. I, I was able to find, uh, I think, you know, close to 10 people who were named, who were held in connection with the crime. All but one were African-American men. Uh, and uh, they ranged in ages from, you know, people in their 60s to people who were in, you know, much, you know, in their 20s. Uh, there was no sense to who they were, 
picking. Now, they eventually did find a suspect, a man named Tyler North, a black man. He was a GI, had returned from uh, World War II, uh, serving in the South Pacific, was attending classes in the GI Bill, and was a young father himself. And he was arrested on evidence that was never made clear um, and held uh, for the better part of a year uh, in connection with the crime. He was indicted by a grand jury. Uh, and the prosecutor at the time uh, uh, kept uh, uh, failing to bring the case up for trial, kick it down the road. Meanwhile, Tyler North remains, you know, uh, in custody during that time. Eventually, uh, uh, on about the year anniversary of Buddy Stevens' death, uh, they, uh, in a surprise move, charged Tyler North with an entirely unrelated crime an entirely ch trumped up charge, in my opinion, uh, of, uh, you know, f allegedly feloniously kissing a white woman, uh, which they charged as, uh, uh, as a sexual assault. And, and he was tr tried and convicted in a day, uh, and sentenced, uh, to a uh, long prison sentence. Um, uh, I, 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 so, you know, they were, they were willing to do anything, uh, to find somebody to hold accountable for Buddy Stevens' death, uh, no matter how flimsy, uh, and I and uh, they don't get Clarence Henderson involved until well after a year after Buddy Stevens' death, when um, uh, a gun is found in a pawn shop in Atlanta that is traced through various hands back allegedly to Clarence Henderson uh, for a very narrow window that would have allowed him to own the gun at the time Buddy Stevens was killed. And that was the only evidence that they ended up using when they arrested uh, Clarence Henderson. They believed they had found their murder weapon and they believed that Clarence Henderson owned it at the time of uh, Buddy Stevens' death. And that was enough to have him indicted. So there's a lot in this book about small town justice. Um, I'm curious, what are your views, some of the more shocking things that you learned uh, about how the case was investigated and prosecuted. I have to say, I mean, I, I, it was one of the more interesting parts of the book to research because a lot of this investigation is happening at really the dawn of modern scientific criminal investigative techniques. Like there's a brand new crime lab that's established at the time, um, you know, very sophisticated for its time. It was considered to be, you know, the preeminent scientific crime lab in the Southeast. And in the, the Constitution wrote about it and, you know, really sort of breathless terms and sort of like a Dick, Dick Tracy sort of way that, uh, you know, this was bringing the heft of science to, to, to bring in, you know, uh, criminals. Uh, but uh, there were other new, new techniques, uh, forensic ballistics, the identification of, uh, of uh, uh, bullets fired from certain guns. That was a relatively new um, science at the time. Uh, lie detectors, the paraffin test that's supposed to, you know, that uh, determines whether there's gunshot residue on your hands or face. That was brand new at the time. Uh, all these things were available uh, for, uh, for this investigation and were used. But at the same time, the investigation itself was pretty shoddy in small town. Um, the bullet that killed Buddy Stevens, um, he was shot multiple times, but the bullet that killed him was not retrieved from the body. Uh, it, uh, in all likelihood, uh, was buried with him. Uh, the bullet that they did retrieve, they retrieved uh, on the surface of his leg. Uh, and that became the, the evidence bullet in the case. Um, it's the, the two doctors who examined him were, were family doctors, you know, examined the body and they weren't uh, criminologists or uh, pathologists in any way, but they were available and they were the ones that did it. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, from that, from that investigation, it was, it was a pretty small town investigation, uh, from, uh, the prosecution side of it, I think there are things that, uh, you know, in our modern sensibilities, we find pretty shocking. Um, like, for instance, the, uh, the special prosecutor who was appointed 
uh, in the case was the judge's older brother. Um, you know, it's that that in itself you would think is uh, as bizarre uh, as you could think, but it was the first trial was also held under armed guard. Uh, state patrol officers ringed the courtroom um, uh, and, and in fear of uh, that violence might erupt. Um, uh, the, yeah, uh, you know, I'll just jump in here. I think no, that's please, Cheryl. that um, is important to note when you talk about small town justice that there was even a trial at all, right? Given the nature Absolutely. of the charges, given you know, one trial, much less three trials, um, three death sentences handed down. And I think that really speaks to, um, you did a wonderful job of setting the tone of you know, what was happening and why this was high stakes and why there were state patrolmen there and why everyone wanted to know what was gonna happen with this because justice was going to have to be served. Right. Really, whoever the 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 um, assailant, right, the criminal in this case, really did not matter. Someone was going to have to pay for what happened. Carrollton really needed um, this crime to be solved um, because, as you know, as I, as I had said, Carrollton and it was and there there were communities like this all across the United States during this post war period that really had all this pent up energy and really saw its future as being very bright. And a crime like this really threatened that, that future, threatened to derail it. So Carrollton really wanted that sense of security that finding the culprit of Buddy Stevens' murder uh, would, would provide. And they were willing to do anything. But they did, want, they did not want it to be a lynching. That's not the kind of uh, community they saw themselves as being. I would argue that if um, Clarence Henderson had been arrested in an, for for this kind of crime in another part of Georgia, he might never have seen the inside of a courtroom. Right. Carrollton, in some ways, as as tragic as his story is, uh, he was fortunate that it was in Carrollton and not someplace else. Um, at the same time, you know, they wanted an orderly trial and they wanted a guilty verdict. Right. You know, uh, that's that was that was how justice was going to proceed. Uh, and that first trial uh, at, that I write about, you know, it, it takes place from sunup to sundown. It's a one day trial. Uh, and uh, his appointed defense attorneys, both of whom are white, uh, provide no criminal defense. Uh, they call no witnesses. The only thing that they uh, allow is that Clarence Henderson takes the stand and gives an unsworn statement before an all white jury, some of whom he knew personally. And, um, and he's convicted and, and uh, sentenced to death uh, at the end of that day. And that's the first trial. And, and, and that, that's, you know, that was not unusual for, the, for that courtroom. Trials did not go multiple days. It was a very efficient courtroom in that sense. And his case might have turned out uh, very differently had it not been for the interest that people outside of Carroll County uh, took in the case. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about some of those people and organizations that took up his cause. Well, the first one, and I can go back to when I was doing my original research on it, and I could not believe it as I was sort of like paging through back copies of the Georgian and the Times Free Press, is that um, it immediately got the attention of the Communist Party of the United States. Um, not something I anticipated in, in Carrollton, Georgia, in uh, you know, what was early 1950 at this point. Um, but the Communist Party um, was interested in cases like Clarence Henderson's, where they saw a gross injustice as a way to you know, raise their own profile as a party that they could come to the aid of someone like Clarence Henderson. They would show their usefulness to African-Americans in particular, where they thought they had a, uh, a real community of interest that they could recruit from. Um, and uh, so the Communist Party organizers in Atlanta formed a Henderson Defense Committee, which met at Big Bethel AME Church uh, in the Sweet Auburn District and uh, uh, hired uh, S.S. Robinson and E. Moore, uh, two African-American attorneys uh, on Auburn Avenue uh, to be his uh, attorneys in his appeal um, to the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, 
so they were the they were the initial uh, movers. Um, almost at the exact same time, though, uh, people were writing to the NAACP's legal defense fund in um, in New York, uh, and to its top attorney, uh, it was Thurgood Marshall, uh, and. Uh, and and saying that the NAACP needed to get involved, and Thurgood Marshall believed uh, deeply that that was that was a role that his office should take. It should be defending uh, black people who are wrongfully accused in Southern states, um, as well as uh, on the civil side, attacking the legalized uh, system of segregation uh, that you know held the rest of the community back. So. Uh, the NAACP is the next to get involved, although they will not get involved until the Communist Party recedes. It's a period where uh, fear of communism is a really important um, uh, part of the political tension. Uh, and, and the NAACP was both, you know, they, they were not interested in communist and socialist revolution. They were interested in, in their own uh, their own goals, uh, and they also did not want their goals to be mixed with those of the Communist Party. So they were they would not get involved with Henderson's defense until the Communist Party had receded. And part of that is because there was a previous case with the Black attorney prior to the establishment of the Gay City Bar that um, had some association with the Communist Party. So in Atlanta and Georgia in particular, they were very sensitive to that because mm -hmm. people thought that that had inflamed um, race relations in the city. Um, also important during this time in the involvement of NAACP is that um, Colonel A.T. Walden, not only was he the founder of um, the Gate City Bar, but he, was all, he had been president or was going to be president of the NAACP. He was their chief counsel in Georgia. He was a national vice president with the NAACP. And so you have this back and forth between the Atlanta chapter and the national chapter and seeing this particular case as an opportunity, like Chris said, on a variety of levels to secure justice, not just for Clarence Henderson, but um, in a broader term as well in Georgia um, as well. Yeah. yeah, for the NAACP in, in Georgia, uh, a win in Clarence Henderson's case mm -hmm. was going to reverberate. And it was uh, it was seen important. And, and um, Colonel Walden's influence is is really central here. I mean, he's the one who's writing to Thurgood Marshall and really, uh, you know, trying to capture Marshall's attention, uh, and, you know, and, and Marshall's attention was so divided. He had so many things on his plate that it needed somebody like Colonel Walden to mm -hmm. uh, to really raise the, the profile of of of, uh, of Henderson's case. And I think also that going back to the point of interest, this was also an interest of the black press. Um, it was the interest of black citizens who were the members of the churches that took the collections that made up the Clarence Henderson Defense Fund. So when you talk about this case, even though it was in, in Carrollton, it actually had a much broader reach um, to Atlanta and nationally because people yeah. were very much interested and did play a part in, in defending him. Helping I'm, him. I'm so glad you brought that up because the Atlanta Daily World, which was the black owned daily in, in Atlanta during that period, was did I don't believe was aware of the Henderson case until after the trial had happened. Mm -hmm. But then they begin to get deeply involved in uh, helping raise money for the defense by encouraging pastors to mm -hmm. uh, in the in the churches to to speak about it from the pulpit. Uh, they take Clarence Henderson, they help Clarence Henderson's uh, wife come to Atlanta. Uh, they get her set up uh, in a in a way that's safe for her and her family. And uh, she gets she travels to the uh, to the black owned to the black churches uh, to help raise money. It's a as much as the Georgian, for instance, is a boosterish newspaper for Carrollton. The Atlanta Daily World really takes seriously uh, during during this period and for its whole um, its whole publication history. Um, uh, representing the black community and and being part of that uplift and and a case like Henderson was was important for them. Uh, it would also go out on uh, the uh, news wires to other black owned dailies uh, 
uh, the Chicago Defender and, you know, any, any number of uh, black owned dailies would, would be carrying this uh, through the wire services as well. So it became part of the national conversation in African American communities, really around around the nation, mm-hmm. along with along with a, a lot of others. I mean, it's not happening in a vacuum. There are other 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 similar trials. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of energy from those groups that uh, really, really helped his his cause in terms of the the fundraising and the pressure that was put on 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 everyone to keep it, you know, keep going on it, keep working for him. Um, so yeah, that, that was yeah because he had he had no resources uh, right. otherwise. Um, this had to be a community right. effort, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and it, wasn't there also one of the first, very first appeals came from Carroll County from, from a, I don't know if it was a, a, a pastor or the, that wrote to the NAACP or. Uh, yeah, there were numerous and I, and I, yeah. and I got to see them uh, in the NAACP yeah. archives, but, um, but there were numerous letters that came in, uh, you know, people would had, had taken some of these news clips from uh, and had torn them out of the, out of the newspaper and mailed them to Thurgood Marshall and said, you got to do something. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and it was, uh, you know, it was in sort of fits and starts for the NAACP because they were, uh, they were coming in really uh, after, after the first trial. I mean, they, they didn't have an opportunity to be there on the ground floor. They had to do a lot of catching up to do. Uh, and, and they were also in competition with the communist party on this. So there were a lot of things that were going on yeah. in this period between the first trial and the, and the first appeal. And also, I think it's important to point out, we talked about the churches raising money and I'm sure other businesses on Auburn Avenue contributed as well, but the trial costs money, right? And so we mm-hmm. talk about this as being, you know, a great and worthwhile effort, but Henderson and Moore were not able to continue on the case because of money, right? And so when you talk about, we talk about it today, it was important even more so in 1950, the, the access to the funds necessary to provide defense um, was a critical part of this, but it was not unlimited and it did come to an end, which required other people to get involved in other strategies to be employed. And so I think, yeah, I think they were very, you know, they were very canny and mm-hmm. um, uh, with how they use their limited resources. Right. And, and, and one of the things, and I say that, you know, going through the NAACP archives is really a trip into a lawyer's brain because so much of it is about how are we going to pay for this? Uh, mm-hmm. And um it was it was it was a shoestring budget to say the least. Uh, and but one of the things that they did that I thought was really interesting is as you know when they won on appeal uh, in front of the all white Georgia Supreme Court, it was remanded back for trial. You know, the, I'm not giving anything away. It's the three death sentences of Clarence Henderson, so we know we're going back. Um, but uh, it was remanded back to Carrollton, where they. We're going to go back into that same sort of um, scenario. And um, I don't, you know, it, it, from, from what I was able to determine, there had never been a black lawyer in Carroll County's courthouse uh, before that time. Right. And what they, what they did is they reached to a friend, an ally in the white community, a man named Dan Duke, a former state prosecutor who had gone after the Klan when he was working for the uh, attorney general's office and was now in private practice uh, to be the white face of a biracial defense team uh, and, and, and hired him just really days before the second trial uh, to come in and essentially, you know, you know, be that sort of front man uh, for, for the effort to save Clarence Sanderson. Um, so that, that was a, I, I think a really smart move on their part, um, to, to find, uh, Duke and, and, and convince him to be a part of that. Um, and eventually because of the lack of resources, Duke would be the last man standing on that defense team. Right. And the story you tell about the legal system at that time is really kind of remarkable because what came through for me, particularly on all three trials at, in Carroll County is the degree to which the judge 
sided almost all the time with the prosecution and gave the defense no quarter at all. I mean, they were really, you know, every mo or it seemed like every motion denied. Um, and that, I mean, the judge could not have worked harder to tilt the, you know, tilt the, uh, the floor in favor of the prosecution. And then you get these, you know, you, you get these verdicts that go to the Georgia Supreme Court and they all get overturned. I mean, right. you know, uh, by, as you said, an all white, uh, uh, you know, court, which was, I was surprised, frankly, I, I, you know, it seemed like it would be very easy for that Supreme Court just to say, ah, you know, okay. Well, and Cheryl, you may have some thoughts on this, but one of the things that I think is important about why they prevailed at the Georgia Supreme Court is that, you know, this period in the early fifties, we're right at the pivot point, the hinge, and when things are going to change in courts generally on the issues of civil rights. And there's pressure on the courts, just like there's pressure in society in general mm -hmm. uh, to uh, address fundamental unfairness in the court system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it would, it would be played in the local press back in Carrollton that Clarence Henderson was you know, remanded back and the jury verdict was overturned on technicalities. But in large part, the state Supreme Court overturned it on lack of evidence that that the that the prosecution had not proven, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that Clarence Henderson was the culprit here. Um, and I think part of that goes back to, you know, what was happening at the time and and it and who wanted to own the decision. Right. And who was responsible for it. Um, and the, the the I think the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, obviously rightfully sent those cases back, but also was being strategic as well in terms of saying, no, this is this needs to be settled in Carrollton um, and really opening the door to the possibility that um, that he could be found innocent, right? right? Because each time they, they could have said they weren't going to hear the case, they could have decided against him, but each time, you know, pushing, 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 pushing the judge in Carrollton to get closer to a fair trial. Um, and, th and that was important because otherwise we would have had that one day trial, right? Or the second, the second uh, trial could have been the last trial, but continuing to push um, and having the right people representing him to get him to uh, his not guilty verdict. Right, right. And, and you know, his defense team, uh, you know, they had the, in, in trials two and three, they they, I think, completely dismantle the state's case in two separate ways. Yeah. You know, the first one being they destroy the time in the second trial, they destroy the timeline that uh, the prosecution uh, relied upon to put the gun in, in you know, in Henderson's hands at the, at the right time. Uh, and in the uh, in the third trial, Dan Duke alone uh, attacks and destroys the forensic evidence that was being relied upon. Uh, now, none of it mattered to the jury, right. but, uh, you know, it was, I think, I think it was really interesting how, um, you know, it, it, despite what Ken, and Ken is absolutely correct. They did not have a lot of wiggle room in that, in that courtroom and yet still managed to really demolish the state's case, which was so weak uh, against Henderson, um, that, um, you know, I think that's something that the Georgia Supreme court couldn't ignore. Right. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, step back for a, a moment and give, give us your thoughts on how you think Clarence Henderson's story informs today's understanding of criminal justice for black Americans. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's a really live issue today, right? Uh, just as it was 70 years ago about sort of the institutional underpinnings of uh, racism and the courts and, and, and society in general. I mean, it's something we're obviously debating uh, pretty vigorously right now. Um, um, people who are in, in that period, uh, in this post-war period, People who felt like they had a historical place in society were concerned that it was being uh, undermined mm -hmm. by a push from below. Uh, you know that a that a push from a, a subjugated class of people threatened who they were. And um, you know there were lots of commentators at the time. Lillian Smith was one of them. Uh, who you know a white 
uh, author who said that, you know, that the, the institution, the institutional racism relied upon uh, poor whites uh, knowing that no matter how degraded they were in their communities, they were at least white. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that they could support then a ruling white class that had instituted segregation. And um, that, uh, you know, what, what is a, uh, a cross class in, within the white community um, alliance is what was the underpinning for the legal segregation and, and, and in the, and across the nation, not just in the South, but the, 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 uh, in more informal system of segregation that occurred in communities all across the United States relied on that same sort of agreement uh, in the white community. Um, and I think that's a really important point, Chris, because you can draw a line from Clarence Henderson to Ahmaud Aubrey. Yes. So we just had that verdict come down from the federal case, but after he was murdered, th there wasn't a prosecution. There wasn't any investigation about what happened initially. It wasn't until that video was released that there even began to be questions raised and process raised, and it became an issue. Um, and and it, it, if, if we had not had that now, now what would have happened in this case? And so um, I think that's something that's important when you talk about um, criminal justice, institutional racism, even the ability to have a fair trial. I think all of that is, is, is highlighted in your book, right? It's was, it was said in 1950, but it applies today. And I think it serves as a really uh, wonderful and important reminder that we have to continue to fight um, for justice for everyone. Right, because even after the formal system of segregation has been dissembled, its imprint remains. Exactly. And you can, you can see that generational impact in the family of Clarence Henderson mm -hmm. uh, and all the Clarence Hendersons around the United States mm -hmm. uh, where that uh, 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 trauma and uh, disenfranchisement and poverty gets passed down to children and grandchildren who become more estranged from the system as a result. And, and you know what Cheryl was saying about the Aubrey case, the same, uh, the same thing applied in George Floyd. Had there not been video uh, and we just had today um, the, the other officers involved were were found guilty. Um, there's the whole question about whether the the justice system would have handled that differently without video. Yeah, I mean, in Clarence Henderson's case, and I, and I think this goes to that point. It required a really brilliant mm -hmm. defense, which he had. Uh, from Robinson, Moore, and Duke mm -hmm. to overcome a system. And even then it had to happen at the Supreme Court level. Mm -hmm. uh, the trials two and three, I think, probably should be taught in law schools. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that legal defense is, I, is just really awesome to read. And I was, I was really fortunate to be able to spend a lot of late nights working on this book mm -hmm. uh, with the trial transcripts. And I was just in awe of how thorough the defense was. Mm -hmm. And even then, it were, they were guilty verdicts. Right. And didn't you say that you thought Dan Duke was really one of the unsung heroes uh, of, the, uh, of the case? Oh, I, I think he's an unsung hero of Georgia. You know, uh, and most people have never heard the name. He would go on later to have a career of several decades as a Fulton County judge, and a lot of people knew him as a judge. Um, in the legal community, but um, you know, in an alternate reality, he would have been governor of Georgia. You know, he had political aspirations. Uh, he uh, he ran for lieutenant governor at one point. He ran for you know other you know he ran for solicitor of Fulton County at uh, a couple of times uh, before he was for as I said, eventually the Times caught up with the man and he was elected as judge. Uh, but. Uh, he, his vision of a more equitable South was just, he was swimming against a current at that point. Uh, but I, I, I think, he, yeah, he's a, he, he is a hero, almost as heroic as Maureen Robinson, who did everything Dan Duke did, but they did it as black men in a system that was, you know, threatened them 
you know, their very lives, really. I want to remind our viewers um, to put questions in the Q&A box. One of our viewers is an inspector in Carrollton, Georgia, yeah. and uh, just loved your book, but uh, said he grew up um, in Sunset Hills, the Sunset Hills Country Club area, and was wondering exactly where the murder took place. So I'm not sure what fairway it is, but it would be on the golf course. Um, I'm trying to orient myself. Um, would be, you know, like if you were to walk out the back of the clubhouse and keep walking straight uh, to the back of the uh the golf course i'm not sure which which hole it is but it would have been back there it's sort of the the farther reaches of what is currently the golf course and they were marched a long way by this massed assailant and it was a moonless night it was starting to rain uh and uh he had a flashlight pointed at him all the time and they went up and over fences and through uh torn up uh cotton fields uh to the point where uh uh, to the point where Buddy finally attacked the man and Nan was able to get free. But that's where it was. Okay. One, one other viewer was asking about the absence of photographs uh, in the book. Mm. Yeah. Um, a lot of the photographs um, were kind of hard to get uh, rights to. Now, there are photographs on the end pages uh, of, of the book. Um, which, you know, I don't know that you can see that. Yeah. And um, these were photos that I was able to get uh, some of the rights to or photos that I took myself. Like there's a photo of the murder weapon, the uh, alleged murder weapon, the 38 revolver. I took that photo, a uh, photo of the Carroll County courtroom where uh, the trials took place, which is another photo I took. Um, some of the rights were just, I couldn't track them down. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned about the publishing industry, as uh, this is my first book, is that if you want photographs as a uh, author, that is all on you. You have to find the rights. You have to pay for the privilege of publishing them. Uh, and uh, but I've also been told uh, by people who seem to know what they're talking about that, um, you know, the days of big glossy photo inserts are kind of past now. They don't really do that, that so much in, in books. But so but if you're interested, if you have the book. Uh, I would encourage you to look in the small type in the first page is where I identify all the photos that are in that uh, in that collage. Uh, Chris, one of our, yeah, okay. you, you were able to um, locate and speak to one of Clarence uh, Henderson's descendants. Is, um, am I right about that? That's right. Um, yeah, tell us uh, about that. Um, it was fairly early on in the writing of the book. I started trying to track down some uh, surviving members of Henderson's family. And um, I located a grandson, um, or at least someone I thought was his grandson, uh, in uh, Decatur, and, and so in, in, in DeKalb County. And I just, I couldn't get him on the phone, so I just drove to his house. And I was on his front lawn knocking on his door when he pulled up uh, into his driveway, kind of, you know, with a quizzical look. Uh, and I told him I wanted to talk to him about his grandfather. Um, it, it's been one of the great joys of working on the project to talk to him and uh, and to hear from his family. Um, when uh, Henderson, the whole Henderson family at the end of the book leaves Carroll County, um, really under threat that something could happen to them. Um, but the Henderson family grew up not knowing the details of why they left Carroll County. They had a very sort of like, you know, matchbook back of the matchbook kind of sketch as to what had happened in Carroll County and why they had to go. Uh, but they didn't know the details. And uh, in talking with his grandson, it was such a pleasure to be able to hand him part of his family history and really redeem his grandfather's innocence. Um, you know, it's been a shadow over that family. Uh, and it shouldn't, it should never have been, and they deserve to know the truth. And if, if, if I wrote the book just for the Henderson family, it would have been enough. 
Yeah. One one of our other viewers was asking. Uh, they said, you know, the pastor was friendly with uh, Nan Turner, and uh, what what do you know about him? Um, Dick Flynn is the pastor uh, of the Pres Presbyterian Church, and he was a really important and energetic person in that community. Um, and one of the things that he did, and, and probably it would raise a lot of uh, eyebrows today, but you know, when there were young people in trouble, he would take them into his parsonage. They would live there. Uh, Nan Turner had a troubled home life and, um, he was, uh, her pastor and, and he, and she was a attractive young woman. And, uh, when Buddy Stevens was killed, baseless speculation landed on Dick Flynn. Uh, Dick Flynn was a great uh, uh, friend of Ralph McGill, the editor of the Constitution, and, uh, and was well known in the Atlanta community. Uh, but these, this speculation would made life very difficult for him in Carrollton, uh, you know, unfairly. Um, I don't think that there's anything to that speculation. Um, but uh, it would be brought up in one of the trials, uh, really, by the defense team as a way to show, hey, you know, did you did you look at anybody other than Clarence Henderson, which I think was a, a perfectly reasonable defense tactic. Uh, but they were only piggybacking on uh, rumors that were already in the community at that time. Yeah. And Chris, I, I mentioned at the start that this is really a person has been a personal journey for you. How did that happen? Because this is 19, this is a 1948 murder. Mm -hmm. um, we're a long ways past that. Uh, it, it was forgotten, I think, by, by most folks. How did this become something you had to do? Well, uh, my first newspaper job was at the Times Georgian in Carrollton, um, where I was a general assignment reporter. Uh, I'd been to uh, college and graduate school in history uh, and had sort of backed into journalism as a job at, and uh, uh, because it paid, well, it did not pay well at all, uh, but, uh, but, it, but it was something that was interesting to me and I, I thought it'd be fun to be a newspaper reporter for a while. Uh, and I'd gone to West Georgia College uh, as, for undergrad, as had my, both of my parents. My parents were undergrads there in the 1940s. And when I got a job at the Times Georgia, my father casually mentioned, he said, have you ever heard of Buddy Stevens? He was a boy that uh, I knew uh, casually in the community, and he was killed not long after I left West Georgia. I don't think they ever figured out who did it. Uh, and he encouraged me to look in the, you know, the archives of the, of the Times Georgian for those stories. And boy, when I did, I found an amazing amount of information. I mean, it was covered in, um, I mean, it was such a sensational crime and the trials were so sensational that, uh, they were covered in really breathless fashion by all the newspapers. Uh, and, um, so that was, that was how I got involved in it. And I was really intrigued by it. And I was kind of looking for a project at the time. And I did lots of research while I was at the Times Georgian uh, in the late 1990s. And then I got a job at another newspaper and all that research went into a box. And, you know, and, and that box followed me from paper to paper and just in, in closets and apartments and houses. And I would talk about it with uh, with friends and colleagues, uh, but never did anything about it until I got back to Atlanta and started working for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Uh, and one day got inspired and pulled one of the notebooks out uh, that contained my research from almost 20 years prior and uh, was hooked again uh, and started writing. You know, started writing almost immediately, started writing before I even. Uh, knew how much more research I had to do. Uh, it's, uh, it was a, uh, I was amazed at, 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 at how, uh, how I was able to really inhabit that same period I had, you know, uh, 20 years earlier, my first newspaper job, only I was, I think probably a better writer, 
uh, at, at this point. Uh, so it was, maybe it was a good idea that I took that time off to learn how to uh, properly write. <laughs> well, it is a, it is a fascinating story. And, and as Cheryl and Ken pointed out, it is uh, really timely today. Uh, this, is, this is not just a 1948 murder mystery. Uh, there are, are it, it rings true today. That's Cheryl, really, I got to say, that's really something that I really wanted the book to be. I didn't want it to be, I mean, there are plenty of good books that are just about a murder or just about courtroom drama, but I really felt like the story of Clarence Henderson had a lot of lessons for us today. So I'm, I appreciate you saying that, Tony. Yeah. Cheryl, Ken, thank you all very much. I have just been fascinated by the conversation. Acapella Books can get you signed copies of uh, the three death sentences of Clarence Henderson, um, because I think you're going to want to know, you know, you, we've talked about the three death sentences, but uh, the details, that's, that's where it just really, really gets you. Uh, Chris Joyner, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, and be sure and, and uh, check with Acapella Books to get a copy of the books. Thank you all. And good thank evening. You. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Good evening. Good night.